Hello, and welcome to this recorded e-learning on the use of global timing constraints. My name is Frank Nelson. I'll be your instructor for this module. This module introduces the primary timing constraints used by all Xilinx customers, the global timing constraints. Please note that this topic is included as part of the essentials of FPGA design course. Timing constraints are fundamental and essential for users to get their performance objectives met. However, the use of global timing constraints is only the first step. You will also need to use path-specific timing constraints, which is a part of the Designing for Performance course. We recommend that you take the time to attend these courses to complete your learning and help make your design successful. After completing this module, you'll be able to apply global timing constraints to a simple synchronous design and you'll be able to make those constraints with the Xilinx Constraints Editor. This module is important if you're going to be attempting to complete any Xilinx FPGA design, so be sure you understand and follow the suggestions made in this module. In this example, we took a small and simple design and implemented it without the use of any timing constraints or pin assignments. Now, this is shown on the left-hand side. Note the logical structure of the placement of logic and the I.O. pins. The implementation tools do a good job of placing and writing the design without using timing constraints. From this example, you can see the logic is grouped close together to provide a good internal frequency and minimize clock skew. Likewise, the I.O. pins are placed together so that the pins from the same component end up next to each other. This makes the most sense since they are related and, of course, confirms that the tools are intelligent. Note that the tools do not anticipate any ground bounce problems. The tools also do not know when the signals will be toggled or how many signals may change simultaneously by your design. It is left to the designer to be certain that you try to disperse switching outputs simultaneously to help avoid any problems with ground bounce. To help with that, the Architecture Wizard and the I.O. Pin Planner recorded e-learning module discuss how to place I.O. pins efficiently so you reduce the risk of creating a ground bounce problem. Not to mention that the I.O. Pin Planner also has a wizard to help you analyze your ground bounce and avoid those kind of problems. Now on the right hand side of this slide you see the same design was implemented with global timing constraints. This required the use of input, output, and internal timing constraints, that is offset in, offset out, and a period, which forced the implementation tools to move the logic closer to the I.O. pins to improve the on and off chip timing. Note that the logic is placed closer to the I.O. pins due to these timing constraints. Timing constraints are used again to communicate your performance objectives to the software, which is in turn used to place and route the design such that it meets your objectives. When timing constraints are used, the placement and running solution can be very different. In this case, pin placement was almost identical to the original implementation without timing constraints. This, of course, could have been assured if the user had placed pin assignments on the design to maintain those pin assignments. However, the placement logic is very different which really doesn't matter to the user except that you have assurance the design is going to have greater reliability and greater speed. But the net result of using timing constraints is the get a faster performing design at the expense of a slightly longer implementation time. Timing constraints are used to define your performance objectives. Tight timing constraints will increase your compile time depending on the speed of your device and design. Unrealistic timing constraints, often called over-constraining, will cause the implementation tools to stop. If your design does not proceed through MAP and you receive a message warning you of an unrealistic constraint, you will need to use your synthesis report or the post-MAP static timing report to determine whether your constraints are realistic. After implementing, review the post-place and route static timing report to determine whether your performance objectives were met. If the timing constraints were not met, use the Timing Analyzer utility from the ISE software to generate a timing report. This will enable you to determine the cause of the timing failure. Causes can include many possible reasons, such as too many logic levels, that is LUTs in series, which is caused by poor HDL coding, perhaps a high fanout net delay, or even a need to pipeline the data path are some prime examples of causes of the tools not being able to meet your timing objectives. Now, you can learn more about interpreting timing reports in the Achieving Timing Closure module in the Designing for Performance course.
Likewise, the same course shows you how to use the timing analyzer and all of its features. Before we proceed to introduce you to the global timing constraints and the delay paths they cover, it's very important that you understand the possible path endpoints you can have. Once you start to understand how the implementation tools look at your design in terms of path endpoints, making the best timing constraints is very easy. While global timing constraints are very simple, understanding possible path endpoints is useful when you learn about path-specific timing constraints. Like global constraints, path-specific constraints are important to properly communicate your timing objectives to the implementation tools. Simply put, path endpoints are I.O. pads and synchronous elements. Synchronous elements can include flip-flops, latches, rams, DSP slices, and shift register LUT resources. Note all the synchronous elements, of course, are synchronous because, of course, they have a clock port. Path endpoints do not include LUTs, NETs, or any other purely asynchronous element, so basically anything without a clock port. Now, most new designers would expect us to say LUTs can be a path endpoint, but they are a purely asynchronous element, so this would not be helpful. But note that if a LUT is reconfigured as a RAM or a shift register LUT, then it uses a clock port and then becomes synchronous, and thus, at that point, can be a path endpoint. So when you think about improving the timing of your design, remember that you are first grouping path endpoints. And these are the only types of path endpoints that can be grouped. Again, that's I.O. pads and synchronous elements. Once path endpoints are grouped, and these are grouped easily by global timing constraints, the next step is to specify a timing objective between the groups. Global timing constraints are easy to make because they save you from grouping path endpoints. This means you don't have to be specific about which path endpoints are part of a specific group. As you will see, that is because global timing constraints group elements based simply on the clock signal that is connected to those synchronous elements. There are three global timing constraints. The first, and most significant because it covers 80 plus percent of internal delay paths, is the period constraint. The elements it groups are simply the synchronous elements it's attached to. In this example, there is one clock, and it attaches to five flip-flops. This defines these flip-flops as both a group of sources and a separate group of destinations. So in this example, there would be three delay paths that would be constrained because they would cover the paths that go from the group of sources to the group of destinations, which happens to be the same group of flip-flops. As you can see, the delay paths cover from flip-flop 1 to 2, flip-flop 2 to 3, and flip-flop 4 to 5. This should also teach you that there is no relationship between the number of path endpoints and the number of constrained paths. The number of path endpoints and delay paths is simply design dependent. And that can be very complex, or it can be very simple. It'll just depend on your design. Now, once you have made your timing constraints, the constraints editor will store them in your UCF file, that is, your user constraints file. This is the same file your pin assignments will be placed. The implementation tools will then use your timing constraints to manipulate the place around solutions so that your design will meet all of your timing objectives. This requires the implementation tools to be very sophisticated. That's because accurately measuring the internal delay is not just a huge database of static numbers. The implementation tools also must be able to properly factor in the clock skew associated with the clock net's internal routing delays. The tools also need to be aware from your net list that not all of your synchronous elements will be toggled in the same clock edge, so that has to be anticipated. And it also has to be aware of your defined clock's duty cycle and the input clock jitter. When you couple that jitter with the performance characteristics of a DCM or PLL you may be using to derive a clock internal signal, then suddenly that calculation is a little more complex. So all of these factors are built into the implementation tools when completing a static timing analysis. And that's done for each iteration. Remember, you may have to do multiple iterations depending upon your speed grade and how tight your timing objectives are. Don't forget that all this may have to be completed many, many times to find a place or route solution that will meet all your timing needs. 
suddenly, now you have a great deal of respect for the ISC software. In the end, the point is that these tools are built to try and anticipate many of the factors that go into affecting the internal delays of your design. You should have some confidence now that this software performs a lot of hard, accurate work on your behalf. In this example, we're just trying to show you how the tools recognize that you're triggering off the negative edge of your clock. So here we have a clock with a 10 nanosecond period constraint, and the first flip-flop is toggled off the rising edge, while the second flip-flop is toggled off the negative edge. So as you have probably already figured out, this means that the constrained delay path should now be constrained to 10 nanoseconds, but 5 nanoseconds. So what happens is the tools will use the 5 nanoseconds as a constraint, and after implementation is completed, you can generate a timing report. And it will report the delay path as being constrained to 5 nanoseconds, not 10. No big deal, except if you do not realize that you are toggling off the negative edge, this might pleasantly surprise you that the tools were thinking about your design and trying to anticipate a problem. The Constraints Editor allows you to enter in an input clock jitter. This enables the implementation tools to plan the place and route appropriately so the jitter can be tolerated. But don't forget, if you have excessive input clock jitter, the newest FPGAs have dedicated PLLs on board inside the FPGA to help you remove it. To learn more about the FPGA's clocking resources jitter characteristic, check your FPGA user guide and look up the specifications. Now, the Architecture Wizard has a jitter calculator that allows you to know how much jitter a PLL or a DCM will put on your clock. This value should then be placed on the clock when you make your period constraint. As you know, this clock uncertainty is automatically subtracted from the period constraint setup paths. The clock uncertainty is automatically added to the period constraint's whole paths. The offset constraints cover paths from input pads to synchronous elements, that is the offset in, and synchronous elements to output pads, and that is called the offset out constraint. Just as with the period constraint, the global offset constraints are associated with the clock net, which automatically groups the synchronous elements that will be considered as path endpoints. So in this example, we have one clock signal. It drives the same five flip-flops. The offset in constraint covers the nine input pads, Note that the input bus is 8 bits wide, and the offset out constraint will cover the three output paths. Now, a lot of people don't easily understand how there can be three output paths. Well, it's simple, really. The two source flip-flops have three different ways to get to two output pins. And as I mentioned earlier, the number of paths will vary greatly by the behavior of your design. Likewise, the input paths covered by the offset in constraint is usually mistaken because an input bus of 8 bits is used in this case. They just basically don't see the big fat wire, but you probably figured that out now. Also, you should note that even after specifying an offset in, an offset out, and a period constraint, it is still possible to have unconstrained delay paths, such as purely combinatorial paths that you see in this example. Remember that the offset in and out constraints do not cover paths between synchronous elements, and they do not cover paths that are purely combinatorial. This example shows how the tools use the clock distribution delay to calculate the effective offset in and offset out delay. As you know, the clock delay is a significant factor in the effective delay and cannot be ignored. Because the input data path and clock path are in parallel for input paths, the tools subtract the clock distribution delay from each input path. Likewise, because the output data path and the clock path are in series for output paths, the tools will add the clock distribution delay to each output path. Therefore, having a positive clock distribution delay helps your input times, but it hurts your output times. To compensate, Xilinx FPGAs include a delay lock loop and or a PLL for your chosen device that will remove the clock distribution delays from your input and output paths. These resources are very important for good chip-to-chip -chip timing. Remember that the PLL and DLL resources do not remove clock skew. The DLL only compensates for the clock distribution delay. The global routing resources are designed to minimize the clock skew, but they cannot remove it entirely. 
This slide shows an example from a timing report generated for an offset out constraint. As you know, this report can be generated when you use the timing analyzer utility from within the ISC software. Now you may recall that the offset out constraint covers output paths from synchronous elements to output pins. In this case, we used an offset out constraint of 15 nanoseconds. This constraint covers the effective output path, which as I just mentioned is the clock path delay plus the data path delay. In this case, please note that it is highlighted in red in the report. The clock path to this register is just under 4 nanoseconds, and the data path from this example was about 10 nanoseconds, which makes an effective delay of about 14 nanoseconds, which is also highlighted in the red circle. So this report is verification to you that the implementation tools automatically account for the clock distribution delay for each data path. They provide the most accurate timing information possible, including taking into account the clock jitter, they use the jitter defined on the associated period constraint in this measurement. Because the tools account for the clock distribution delay, you can specify your pin-to-pin -pin timing goals without knowing what the internal clock distribution delay will be. Well now, we wanted to give you a chance to test your knowledge of the basic global constraints and what paths they cover. This is again a very simple example, certainly not very realistic, but I wanted to make sure you had a chance to think of another example. In this case, I based the questions on some of the most common questions I get. So this example contains two clock nets, which is important because this means that if you were constraining this design, you would probably use a period, an offset in, and an offset out for each clock domain to properly constrain the design. The first clock, clock one, has two synchronous elements, which is probably the first question you would ask, how many synchronous elements are in each clock domain? because that will dictate how many paths will be constrained. In this case, the period constraint will cover one path from the flip-flop to the latch. The second clock, clock two, has only one synchronous element, so a period constraint on this clock would not actually constrain any paths. This is again because the tools do not have a path from a source to a destination synchronous element. Now we want to introduce you to the Xenix Constraints Editor so you can get an idea about how you're going to be making your global timing constraints on your design. To start the Constraints Editor, double click the Create Timing Constraints button in the Processes window of the IC software. If you don't see this button, expand the User Constraints button to then see the Create Timing Constraints button. After the Constraints Editor opens, there is a Constraints Type window in the upper left-hand corner of the GUI. This is highlighted in red in this example. To make your global co timing constraints, double-click the Clock Domains button. This will open the Create Timing Constraints GUI, which automatically reads from your design's netlist. All the clock signals and I.O. pins from your design will automatically be read. So as you can see from this screenshot, the input clock signal has a name of clock underscore pin. This then propagates a group name, or in this case, a clock time name of clock underscore pin. So it borrows that name. That makes sense. That makes it easier to make your constraints. The time spec name is automatically given as TS underscore clock pin, and that's just a label. And in fact, all they did was take that group name and just put in TS underscore in front of it and the TS will stand for timing specification. This makes it easier later on when you're reading your UCF contents to actually identify the timing constraints because they have the TS in front of them. So this is the label the timing constraints will be given in your UCF file. So to make a period constraint, you just right click on the constraint that has already been made and click on edit constraint. To make a new period constraint, you right click in the create timing constraints window and select create constraint. The constraint entered will have default units of nanoseconds and assume a 50-50 duty cycle. But this can be modified with the GUI. As constraints are made with the constraints editor, they are added to the user constraints file. And then you can use any text editor to edit the UCF or again come back to the constraints editor and modify the constraints with this utility. Many designers keep their timing constraints in a separate UCF file from their pin assignments, area constraints and placement constraints. This allows the designer to keep all their fixed constraints, that is, their pin assignments and placement constraints, in one location, and then never modify the contents after they have implemented with those constraints. So you see, it's kind of human nature. They like to keep their timing constraints separate because they end up frequently editing their timing constraints file. 
And this makes debugging a little easier. So to help with this, the Xilinx Constraints Editor allows you to select a different constraints file to be edited and modified with the utility. And if you're not sure what constraints file you have, you can use the drop-down arrow to make sure that the tools find all of your design's constraints files. Now that you have selected to create a period constraint, the clock period GUI opens up, and this allows you to customize all the features of the period constraint I already spoke about. So from this GUI, you can modify the name of the constraint, even though it defaults to TS underscore clock net name. You can modify it to whatever you want. You can specify the constraint in nanoseconds or megahertz or other timing factors, whichever you prefer, and can customize even the clock duty cycle. You may also specify with this GUI uh, which edge is going to be the active edge of the clock signal. One of the other necessary features is the ability to make a period constraint relative to another period constraint. This is helpful in the case when you have a single source clock for multiple derived clocks. If your design uses a DCM or PLL, you simply define a period constraint on the clock input to the DCM. The software will then automatically push the constraint onto all of the used clock outputs of the DCM, using the relative period constraint to define the frequency and phase relationship of those derived clocks. You also can specify your input clock's jitter. If you specify a value for input jitter on the clock, the jitter is used to calculate worst case timing. When checking your setup times, the jitter is subtracted from the clock period. When checking your hold times and clock to output times, the jitter is added to that clock period. Global offset in and offset out constraints are likewise entered from the same area of the constraint type window. Once the customization window opens, you can specify the length of time you want to constrain all of your input or output paths. Remember that these constraints will optimize all the input paths or output paths to the selected clock domain. Now, most designs also require pin-specific offset-in and offset-out constraints, which cover only the paths to or from specific I.O. pins. Now, these can be entered as well with the Xilinx Constraints Editor. These constraints are covered in more detail in the Timing Groups and Offset Constraints module that is a part of the Designing for Performance course. Now I want to give you another challenge. In this case, a customer has their FPGA interfacing with a couple of other components. The upstream device has output delays of 4 nanoseconds. That means the data won't arrive at the FPGA for 4 nanoseconds after the clock edge. This delay also includes board level delays. Since we're talking about clocks, let me tell you that this is a simple synchronous system in which all the components are connected to the same clock signal even though it's not drawn here. You can also assume that there is no clock skew. And so just to keep it simple and focus on our concern of planning timing constraints. Now the downstream device has an input delay of 5 nanoseconds, which also includes its board routing delays. Our goal is to get this system to run at 100 megahertz. That means after the bitstream is made and assuming it passes a static verification, which, as I mentioned, is required by the implementation tools to occur if the design is to implement without errors. The customer can then take the bitstream, program the device on his board, and then drive a 100 megahertz signal to the clock port. And that should assure the system will operate perfectly. To do this, you obviously have to make some timing constraints. So the real question is, what timing constraints are going to be necessary? Now, take a couple minutes if you need to, even review the slides if you need to. Go ahead and pause the recording if you want, and then continue when you have formulated your answer. Because you want the entire system that is bored to run at 100 megahertz, that is with 10 nanosecond period, the delays from one synchronous element to another synchronous element must be no more than 10 nanoseconds. Therefore, the period constraint, which is to constrain paths from one synchronous element to another, must be 10 nanoseconds. The offset in and offset out constraints must be calculated relative to the delays of the upstream and the downstream devices. For the input paths, you need the delay from the synchronous element in the upstream device to the synchronous element in the FPGA to be 10 nanoseconds. The delay through the synchronous element in the upstream device plus the trace delay is 4 nanoseconds as shown in the figure. Hence, the delay from the 
within the FPGA can be no more than 10 nanoseconds to 4 nanoseconds, which will give you a final offset in constraint of 6 nanoseconds. Similar calculation is completed for the offset out constraint. 10 minus the 5 nanoseconds will be 5 nanoseconds. And that explains why your answers here are 10 nanoseconds for the period, offset in of 6, and an offset out of 5 nanoseconds. In summary, performance expectations are going to be communicated to the implementation tools with the use of timing constraints. And global timing constraints are what we covered here, but as I mentioned, there are only one part of timing constraints. You also need to learn about some advanced timing constraints called path-specific constraints. That way, you can constrain your design effectively. Now, we cover that in the Design for Performance course. I think I probably mentioned that a couple of times already. Now, the period constraint, your basic constraint, covers delay paths between synchronous elements. The offset in constraint covers delay paths from input pins to synchronous elements. And the offset out covers delay paths from synchronous elements to output pins. And all these constraints can be made with a constraints editor. And all these constraints are going to be stored in your design's UCF file. Well, there is lots of useful information about timing constraints that can be found on Xilinx's website. First of all, the constraints guide provides information about UCF syntax and HDL syntax in case you want to enter your timing constraints with your HDL source code. There is also information about path-specific timing constraints, which is a very popular topic as part of the Designing for Performance course. The Timing Constraints Guide, which is a separate manual, also provides information about placement and area constraints. So this manual provides more information about all constraints, not just timing constraints. Both documents are very well uh, worth your time to review. And again, you can get these from the Help menu when you start the IC Tools. And this will take you on Xilinx's website and show you the available software manuals. If you would like to see what other courses we offer or what other free RELs are available, go to the Xilinx Education link you see here. I would also like to mention again that there are other architecture modules available that discuss the basics of Xilinx's newest devices. You may find this useful, especially if you want to learn more about the differences between the available FPGAs. But whatever you do, please take a second and let us know what you thought of this recorded e-learning. Just click on the icon on the next page and tell us what you think. Again, my name is Frank Nelson. You've been listening to the Global Timing Constraints Recorded e-learning module. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for listening. And again, thanks for your business.